In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer health and fitness questions asked by listeners and viewers just like you. But the way we open the episode is by talking about current events. We mention scientific studies. We talk about our own personal lives. Today's episode, 35 minutes. The first 35 minutes was that intro portion. After that, we got into the fitness questions. I'm going to give you a breakdown of the whole episode, okay? So we open up by talking about new conspiracy theories. This is, if you're a conspiracy theory fan. Holy moly. Like me and Justin. Yeah. Whoa, this is uh, this oh. is the best time ever. This is harvesting season. Yeah. We do. So there's a Wayfair conspiracy theory that's really crazy. Yeah. So we talk about that. Uh, then we talk about the UFC. Um, it was uh, an incredible card. Uh, Adam watched it, said it was a great fight. So we talked totally a little bit about that. Totally missed those. out on that one. Uh, then I talked about Goya Foods and the controversy around them and how the boycott seems to have uh, backfired with them. Hmm. Then we talked about the Washington Redskins. Uh, don't know what we're going to call them soon because they're going to be changing their name. Yeah. Uh, we talked about art and how much we value it. Uh, Justin had an experience with the bark beetle. So he told us Scary about that. Scary bastards. Uh, I talked about the drunk guy in Carmel who gave me a compliment. Uh, <laughs> and we talked about a study on the most effective way to lower cholesterol if you have familiar hypercholesterolemia. I think I said that right. Then we got into answering the questions. Here's the first one. Uh, what are some of the best moves for building the biceps and triceps? The next question, can you make gains on a three-day-a-week workout routine? The third question what do we think of the Jefferson deadlift? This is a weird exercise. You might need to look it up if you've never heard of it, but we give our thoughts on it. And the final question, when we were all kids, what did we want to be when we grew up? Um, also, this month, MAPS Strong is 50% off. Now, MAPS Strong is a workout program uh, inspired by strongmen. Okay, so there's some traditional exercises in this, and there's some non-traditional exercises, but the whole goal is is to make your body strong and solid. Many of the side effects people experience from following this program are a very fast metabolism. They tend to get a faster metabolism as the muscle builds and the strength builds. Increased work capacity, so your body's ability to recover improves, and you get really, really good results on the posterior chain of your body. That's your back, your butt, and your hamstrings. This program is uh, also, which is kind of weird, uh, one of our most favorite programs among our female listeners. We didn't anticipate that when we put the program out. I think it's because it works the posterior chain so well, uh, but they love it. Anyway, it's 50% off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsstrong.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-R-O-N-G.com. And then use the code STRONG50. That's S-T-R-O-N-G-5-0, no space, for the discount. And it's t-shirt time. Oh, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Yeah. We've got two winners for Apple Podcasts, two winners for Facebook. The winners for Apple Podcasts are Crusherman0826. I'll crush it. And Stock Living. For Facebook, we have Angela Romero and Zach Nolden. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Justin, what a great time for conspiracy theorists. Wow. It's <laughs> like a heyday out there. Holy shit. Have you guys seen? Did you guys see the Wayfair? I can't oh. watch anymore. Dude, I so, just can't. I can't get sucking me in too I, much. I keep saying that because I don't want to like become a crazy person or anything, but- it's like my wife and kids are they're gone this week, you know, they're going on vacation. <laughs> like, and I'm at home and I'm just, oh my God, look at all this like information. Dude, it's right here. So here's how the story develops. Okay. Somebody um on Reddit sees something very strange, right? They go on the Wayfair site, which Wayfair sells a lot of home products. Sometimes, you know, there's third parties right. in there. Shelving, you know, like beds. tables, all that stuff. Yeah, just like kind of like Amazon, right? And this person notices that there are these cabinets, regular cabinets, like you would you would you would put your books or or whatever in, and some of them are being sold for like ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, which is weird. Like wow. And it's not just one; it's it's there's several of them. So like, that's kind of strange. Like exotic hardwood. Yeah, and every yeah. single <laughs> every, sounded even worse. I know every single one is you know it, it, the price doesn't make any sense. There's one left in stock for each of them. And then to make it even weirder, 
the cabinet would have a strange name on it, like Annabelle cabinet, yeah. uh, you know, Samaya cabinet. Ugh, yeah. And they're all the same. They're all like these white cabinets. Couldn't, they're like, this is very yeah. weird. Yeah, why is this one so much more expensive? Yeah, and so then this person, you know, and this is the thing about the internet that I, that I love. It's like they're the best, like, detectives of all time. Not necessarily because they're accurate, but because they'll make a connection with something. Right. right. So they then they connect the names of these cabinets to missing children. Mm -hmm. So it's like Samaya cabinet, fifteen thousand dollars, and then boom, they'll find a missing thing for a girl named Samaya, whatever. Who's fifteen years old? Fifteen right? years so, old. Yeah, you see Annabelle five or like at five years old. Yeah, you know, and so it's like you're like, oh my, is this is this true? Is this like uh, this is too crazy? So you it, know, for me to take in right now, it spread on Twitter like crazy, so much so because usually conspiracy theories don't get mainstream attention. Yeah. This one was getting some mainstream attention, and then Wayfair came out and said, oh, no, 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 that's- Oh, that's not true. That's not true yeah. because it's a mistake, and they started taking him down. So at first, everybody was like, ah, oh, it's just yeah. a crazy glitch or whatever. But the, the, the internet sleuths- But it keeps going. Went, kept going to work, yeah. and they found pillows- Throw rugs. like Because at first what Wayfair said is they said that the cabinets are industrial grade. Oh, they're priced that way. Yeah. It's $10,000 because it's a special cabinet. <clears throat> so everybody was like, it's well, all good. Yeah, and it keeps moving on to a lot of these other uh, types of businesses that sell goods online. They're starting to find a lot of these similar items that are being sold. And you're questioning, what? why is this so expensive? Dude, what, like, what, what's happening? Stuff that should not be this price, like... Pillows, pictures, posters, you know, uh, uh, a diaper genie, like weird shit that, okay, there's no, I've never seen a pillow that costs, unless it's like encrusted in diamonds yeah. or it contains a child, uh, <laughs> is going to cost them. So it's really, really weird. Um, and it's now they're finding it on Amazon. They're finding all this. Yeah. And then when they're looking at the comments underneath some of the stuff, it's kind of creepy. Someone else took this, like a skew put it on this like Russian search engine mm -hmm. and it had like very like weird pictures completely of, different yeah, of kids, yeah. you know, and, and shit. So it's fucking weird. Well, dude. again, it's, and it's crazy. And it's like, and then you, you start thinking like, how would they, you know, be able to do all this trading back and forth and get away with it in a way like they use their own code. They, they find ways of like you using other platforms like this to like actually get away with this kind to, of stuff. To launder the money. Yeah. You know? So this is, this is. So it's either money, money laundering or it's a uh, child trafficking. Right. There's something going on. Two, two things that, okay. So I went down the rabbit hole as, as well as you did. You? Yes, I did. And the two things that seem weird to me that don't add up, I should say. One, the the girl who found this, okay, the, the girl you talk about on Twitter, mm -hmm. do you know that that like this is like part of what she does, right? Is she looks for like um Yeah, she's one of those people, right? Yeah. yeah. So that already is fishy sure. to me, right? The other thing that doesn't add up to me is that the photos don't align with every other photo that's on Wayfair. So Wayfair, if you look at every normal piece of furniture, is shot professionally with the type of camera and uploaded a certain way mm -hmm. and those are not so that to me screams like doctored like yeah exactly Photoshop. right doctored photoshopped right uh whether that be from the people that found it and then you know fake screenshotted it or whatever and then photoshopped it or somehow got hacked that even Wayfair wasn't even a part of all this. Well, so, there's third parties on there, so they might not even be aware that their site is being used to launder right. money. And yeah. they, they found this, too, even in YouTube, where they found a way that, that pedophiles were talking and communicating to each other That's in the true. comment section. This is true. That's true. And so it's it's like it's not a huge leap to think that something like this could happen using other platforms. Dude, I saw one guy who he... Because these, I tell you, these people are crazy, right? These conspiracy theories. I don't mean necessarily crazy, although a lot of them are. I mean crazy in that they find crazy details. One guy was zooming in on the pictures of some of these things that were for sale, like a pillow or whatever. And, you know, they staged the room, right? So they'll post a picture of a pillow or post a picture of the, a bed that's for, you know, 20 grand. And then in the background, you'll see like a bookshelf. So he zoomed in on the books that were in the back and through using this, there's apparently there's a website that you can post a picture to that you find and it'll show you if the pixelations match and you can see if something's Photoshopped. So he used that website and he says, these books were Photoshopped. So they changed 
the titles of these books. Oh, see. And no, the titles that were on there that were on the Wayfair site were the ones that looked like they they changed and they were changed to the I forgot the name of the books. But these are creepy books about like murder, child, you know, uh, abduction. Like he's like they're signaling to each other is what his his theory was. Oh dude, my it God. was a it was a bad weekend. Let me tell you, Ugh. I was going down this. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, dude. <laughs> well, the fact that we got caught in there. The, the fact that Wafer had to speak out, and then what they said. Yeah, what they said was a, that was fishy to me too. The yeah. response was kind because of, the original response was almost like they tried to justify the price of these cabinets. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like like yeah. why not be like oh we're gonna investigate this or why not just be like I don't we, know what this is. Yeah, I don't know what this is. We yeah. didn't post that because that's. That's what doesn't make right. it doesn't make sense to me that everything else on the website looks professionally shot and had like that as is if it had to be an approved by Wayfair to be put up mm -hmm. on it. Well, this is unverified, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, there was a <laughs> there, there, somebody on there was like claiming that they worked at, at oh, Wayf I read some of these at Wayfair. Yeah, right. So this was another sort of a theory that there was um like a like a diamond group or a platinum group that handled more of the bigger accounts. So like the, the goods that were like more expensive than the regular oh. items uh, that they would they would like manicure uh, and, and basically have all the the talking and exchanging those goods like internally within that uh, you know sort of platinum group. The rest of everybody that worked there didn't even uh, they'd have to just pass it along, and so then they would like now this handle is, it. This is where this gets crazy now, right? Because um, Doug, how many people have worked for Wayfair? I'm guessing. Tens of thousands. Oh, it's a huge I know. company, right? So now uh, here comes all the people that are are fucking mad, right? That yeah, used to work. They're piling on, right? Yeah. So now I'm reading all these things of people saying like, "Oh my God, there was actually boxes that were labeled ASAP, and we had to move them within an hour's yeah, time exactly. somewhere else, and they weighed about 110 pounds." And yeah. oh, dude, I, I bring that up to save everybody from <laughs> you dude, know, going down that hole. I saw one that was really weird. There was one that were they were paintings or pictures, and they were like children's pictures. They, they looked like whatever, like a kid drew them or something. Mm -hmm. and there were three of them, and it was I don't remember what the price. It was something. It didn't make any sense. Like fifteen thousand dollars for these three pictures. Then the three pictures, when the person looked up the specs, and it's literally they're they're like I don't know fourteen inches by fifty. It's like a small three small pictures that you would put up on the wall. Then in the specs, one of them weighed twenty five. Pounds. The other one weighed thirty six point something pounds. The guy's like, "How do these weigh that much?" Unless they're trying to show you. And I was like, "Oh no, yeah, this could get this. Could, this could this. You could go down this rabbit hole, and everything can I'm make just, you feel like this is true." I mean, you know? I'm glad people are looking into stuff like this, though. You know, like yeah. I'm, I'm, even if it's not like all completely verified, like uh, there's probably some instances where. You know, this could happen. This is a likely scenario. Well, the the one of the weak because the, the internet is so decentralized, and a lot of these companies are really just kind of middlemen, right? Like Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. They or YouTube, like YouTube hosts uh, videos, and you know how many people down? You know how many people upload videos every single day on YouTube? Yeah. How do you manage all that? You can't, right? So they put in algorithms to notice certain things or whatever. But technically, if you're smart, you could get around it, and people have done this like what justin said with pedophiles communicating in the comments they proved that to be a, a real thing youtube had to go in and, and investigate it's not uh totally un uh, you know unreasonable to think that yeah, they would launder money this way wayfair and it would be doesn't work this way though wayfair is not like an amazon or a i anybody. thought they did have third parties no, i don't think so i'm, if I'm, I'm not, not mistaken no i don't think so I, oh that would suck because no, that would mean that they were in on well that's just it is right. I, that's why it's again weird and fishy to me because it's not a site like that it's mm. not a site where a, you can bring your furniture and sell it on there mm. doesn't work that way it's all wayfair stuff it is yeah oh, I don't know oh yeah it's just like living spaces like the i have way a bunch of wayfair stuff in my house mm -hmm. no yeah. kids came in a box you know they were all it was all normal <laughs> shit yeah you know and it's all their as far as i know it's all their brand just like living spaces has theirs. now I, what i will tell you which the, here's a part that's weird for me because i'm not the conspiracy guy yeah you're not like justin uh, and i go yeah you guys are way no, more. we need somebody to balance but now. here's the thing that is weird though oh no it I, says here that they you can sell on wayfair that people there can sell go. their own okay, stuff so on Wafer. Here, the thing that I tripped out on, and I told, I remember the first time that. So this was uh, just three years ago. Three years ago, um, when we moved, uh, I, I told Katrina, I don't want to bring anything up that we have. So we like literally, you guys remember, like why oh, we sold everything, sold everything, and then and got all new stuff. And everything that we bought from was Living Spaces and Wayfair. And up until that point, I wasn't very familiar with the companies. 
So we go there and there's there's one over here in Fremont. There's another one over, I think, in like Dublin area. There, we, we have like two or three near the Bay Area. And I went to went to these places. Now, have you guys been to one of these before? I have. Yeah. And what you said made perfect sense back then. I remember what you said. Yeah. It's, it's enormous. It doesn't even, it makes it makes Costco look like a, a little liquor store. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is, when you walk into it, it has to be one of the most, like, a, like amazing buildings I've ever seen. I mean, they're just, the property, to own that property in the Bay Area has to be bajillions of dollars yeah. just to own it. A number right. we never heard of. And then yeah, and then you walk in and it's <laughs> it's filled. I mean, it's it is filled Genius. as as far as the eye could see, football field lengths of furniture from I mean, it's just like how much capital do you have to have I to know. be yeah. that that so I remember telling Katrina that when I'm like, holy shit, how does it where did this and where did this company come from? Yeah. You said it on the podcast. You're like, I don't know how they make money. Yeah. How do they profit uh, you know, with all that? Because that's a lot of sunk capital. That's a lot of yeah. investment. I know. Yeah, you have to have big now I know now I know that they're worldwide. I know they're massive. I know they started on the East Coast. Mm. So this could have been a company that's slowly grown and under me never knowing who the hell they were mm-hmm. until recently coming over to California. But man, it, I remember seeing it going, this just doesn't well, add up to well, me. Well, somebody connected right. them to the Clinton Foundation and how they worked with the Clinton Foundation, which the Clinton Foundation, according to the conspiracy theorists, uh, connects to all these. Oh, know, man. Dude, here's, look, here's the, here, this is the truth now. This is not a conspiracy theory. The amount of people being investigated and arrested in, in, in sex trafficking, human trafficking, has exploded yeah. over the last four years. What's that group? Okay, there was that one actress from Smallville who was uh, helping that dude. Is it Nexium? What was the name yeah, of that Nexium. group? Is it Nexium? Yeah, yeah Nexium. They used to brand uh, these women. And they, they, they actually had women recruiting uh, these women for... Basically, to to network, uh, you know, powerful women and in you know, and CEOs and like you know, in tech. And so whatnot. this is this is real, okay? So if you don't believe me, you could pause the podcast, look this up. They've been they're going to jail. Like there was a group, yeah, it was a cult called Nexium, and one of the actresses from Smallville, I forgot her name, uh, blonde girl, or whatever, was part of it. She actually would recruit for this guy, and they would bring in these girls and promise them that they'd get, you know. A, you you get in on the the Hollywood you know action or whatever, um, but you'd have to provide us with compromising you know photos or videos. This is how they use the blackmail them. Right, and you had this huge network of sex trafficking. There it is. Allison Mack is her name. She's arrested. So they're they've been not only they are for sure going to jail for this. This is a real thing. Yeah. So here's the other crazy part of it. And so these are all all these women that were connected to this, and they're all coming forward and saying. That they got branded, literally branded. Yeah, they branded them right, like uh, you know, in the inner thigh or like yeah, near their that. pelvic bone. Fucking weird, yeah. right? Fucking weird. Well, here's the crazier part: the Nexium Group owned eleven child cares in Mexico facilities, and so now they're investigating these child care facilities, and and they're saying, uh, did, were they using this as a way to kidnap yeah. or who it, knows? D- disgusting, like and, dude, and this, some seriously evil shit. And this is real. This yeah. is not a conspiracy theory. So. Uh, more yeah. more real shit. I'm going to transition us out of the fucking yeah, right. conspiracy theories There here. we are. Right. Uh, did you guys, any of you guys watch the UFC this, this weekend? No. Okay. No. The greatest UFC card ever. Really? No way. Yes. Epic. Now, now I mean, fought? three title fights. Even, the, even the, the, the fights on the undercard were just, every single fight was amazing. Like, hmm. It was just a great fight. Now, here's the, tr- the part that we we're about, I don't know, halfway through it. And uh, and I was teasing Katrina because she was like multitasking. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, this is, these fights are incredible. And she's like, I know, I know, I know. And she keeps getting on her phone doing work and stuff. She goes, I don't know what it is. And I'm all without the fans. So oh, this yeah. is the part that was trippy. And they, I, I commend UFC. They did an incredible job. Um, I, I got to look up. Oh, maybe Doug can look up the UFC. I think it's UFC 251 was the, the number. What it was on pay per view streams. How it did. Because I imagine with nothing going on in sports, most people besides you two knuckleheads were probably watching it. Mm. And it was a, the most amazing card that Dana has probably put together ever. But because there was no crowd, you, so you could hear. Now, I liked it. And so I, you I'm, could hear the punches. Oh, and, the- and you could hear the coaches. Every The coaches yelling and talking to him. It reminds you of like, if you, obviously you guys have watched the UFC. The, yeah, uh, like that. The, the show, right? Yeah, 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 the reality show. Tough yeah, or whatever. Yeah, tough or whatever, like that, whatever, contender or whatever. So it, it was like that because you could hear everything. And then afterwards, I thought it was a cool feature. When the fight was over, 
because they don't have Joe Rogan in the ring interviewing or doing anything like that. The, the they would actually get on the the headset. So the fighter who won afterwards would get on the headset and talk about his fight afterwards. And the fights were good. And the fights were amazing. But I have to say that even as as amazing the fights were, I didn't get that same rush of energy because uh, you had yeah. these fights that were, I mean, just so good. What, and I, I was told Katrina when we got into it, I was like, you know, I can envision what would the crowd, it, they would be like, oh, ah, uh, you would hear the whole crowd normally because the fight was so close and so good and none of that. What did that do for like the finishing? Because you know how when when one of them gets hurt just a bit and then the crowd sees that right. and, then they go, and then that pumps up the fighter to then pile on, uh, did it affect how they were like fighting so i that's hard to say right yeah. you'd have to ask the fighter what it was like for them i would imagine as a fighter you probably appreciated it right it was quiet you could hear your coach i would i personally because huh. i've i've competed and i've been, competed in front of crowds and the crowd plays a factor because you're you can either be anxious or now people are watching you or maybe it drives you right, right. It fuels you yeah i always perform better when there wasn't a crowd because i didn't feel like Nervous. i was being right yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I, that's, so i imagine it, it favors some and, and then it hurts others right yeah. I, I imagine if it yeah. was a, a conor mcgregor fighting he thrives off the crowd right yeah. right he, so he feeds off of that energy he needs that, yeah. right where if you're somebody who's maybe an underdog or maybe you're not as popular and you get more nervous with everybody yelling and stuff like that. Now you can just be laser focused. You can hear your coach giving you cues. It definitely made for incredible fights, whether that was the pairing that Dana did such a good job on or not. But as a spectator, um, they were great. And I, what I wonder is, man, if they had a crowd behind that, how much more would I have been excited about this fight? And if they were not great fights, how much of a like a it's a, it's the reason why old sitcoms had a laugh track in the background. Right, right. Yeah. I thought of the exact same thing actually. Mm -hmm. You say that, I was like, I wonder if there would be any value of having like a fake crowd for you <laughs> yeah. to hear. Yeah. Like here when every oh ah every time yeah. a punch Even happens. We do. We get yeah. jazzed by the, the crowd. You know, we feel like we're a part of something and it, and it changes the feeling of it. Who fought yeah. who, who put the card up, Doug? Put UFC two fifty one up on Is the that screen, one so. guy, what's his last name? Manda Mandevel or what's his name? Hispanic dude, long hair. Did he did he fight? Oh, he right. yeah, he stepped in. He wasn't supposed to fight. That was that was the main event, right? The main event. Uh, he he stepped in for. Oh my god, I can't think of the name right now. Pull up the card, Doug, so we can go through every every single fight, and I'll tell you how it went down. Okay, yeah, because I, I there's something I want to tell you guys about that guy in particular, and I can't remember his name. Jorge. No, it's M A Y is his la his last name. I, I don't I didn't know much about him. My my cousin was talking about him. He was supposed to be the underdog that was going to upset him, and that fight could have went either way when yeah. he watched it. It was such a good fight. Let's see here. Uh, Just do UFC 251 card. There, there you go. There we go. Yeah. So Usman fought him. There he is, right there. Oh, M A S. Sorry, not M A Y. Oh yeah, no, Jorge. no. Jorge. Oh, okay. You see it on the right? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Masvidal. That's the guy. Masvidal. Okay, yeah. so did you guys know how he first got kind of discovered? So I know he's been a, like a longtime fighter, and yes. he's just he's exploded in the last like year or two. That's why I didn't know who he was. So, so um, do you guys remember those those YouTube videos with Kimbo Slice, and he's fighting yeah. in the yeah. backyard in like yeah, Miami? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So Kimbo Slice, that's how he made his. That's how he got popular, right? Jorge was, uh, and I think that's Jorge. I'm pronouncing it right. He was a street fighter. He well, he so uh, Kimbo Slice organized some fights that didn't involve him, and he was one of the guys uh. that the video went crazy. It went viral because he walks in and he's like off the streets. He fights another dude that's real tough, and he was just a he was brutal. Oh, he was a badass. Yeah. I mean, the fight was great, and honestly, like I mean, Usman totally uh, strategically beat him. Mm. So he comes in, right? Jorge comes in with a, I think it was like a two week notice, something crazy, drops 20 something pounds to come to fight him. Wow. Yeah. In two weeks. Yeah. And it was a, <laughs> and it was a great fight. It would new it, diet coming out soon. Yeah. <laughs> the two week, 20 pound diet. Yeah. And same Tape thing, worm. same thing for the second one was amazing, amazing fight. I actually thought that Max Holloway actually won the fight. He didn't. Um, those are all. Those are all. Oh, Jose Aldo lost again, huh? All three of those are title fights. Man. Oh wow! Yeah. So, so that guy uh, Jorge, um, he came out and defend. Did you guys hear about the whole thing with Goya Foods? You hear what happened? Mm -mm. I didn't. So Goya Foods um, is a is a privately owned company owned by the, the the grandchildren of Spanish immigrants. So it's an it's like an American success story, right? And they make, you've seen Goya foods. They make all kinds of Hispanic based mm -hmm. foods. Very, very popular. 
one of the number one selling uh, providers uh, in in America of of Hispanic foods, loved by many families. I bought a lot of the products, but anyway, this guy comes out um, and he speaks. Um, I don't. I think Trump was doing a, a speech or something, and he comes out and praises Donald Trump. Really says how much uh, what a great leader he is and all this and that. Well, um, huge backlash, right? So the the you know the 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 left calls for a boycott on Goya Foods for su- speaking out in support of of Donald Trump, and they start this whole thing about boycotting them. Well, it to- it seems to have totally backfired because the opposite effect happened with people and Hispanics supporting Goya Foods because. It's a it's a immigrant owned company. Mm. They like the food, and the guy comes out and is like, "Look, I, he's here's why I support him. So agree or disagree, but I need I should be able to say what I want without you know people going crazy, whatever." So they're actually getting um, more sales. It seems as oh, a wow. result of this of this back. Uh, I think people, yeah, and I don't necessarily think people uh, agree or disagree. I think people might be sick of the. Uh, boycotting companies for you know right for, for especially if they have good products it's like uh, it, it's tough at the end of the day like politics get involved and then all of a sudden now we can't enjoy you know products we used yeah. to well so what i did when this all started uh i saw this and i kind of predicted i'm like this is, i don't think you guys do you guys remember when i was trying to look them up and seeing if they were publicly traded Mm-mm. okay so when this all happened i'm like i bet you because what a difficult company to attack first of all he didn't really say anything that was that crazy Plus, it's an immigrant-owned Hispanic company. I'm like, I bet this is going to backfire. So I went on, I went on and to see if they were publicly traded. So I'm like, I bet you their stock is going to go up, but they're not. They're a privately owned uh, company. Oh, so yeah. oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Really well, did you see too in in terms of like that whole cancel culture kind of stuff? Like uh, the the uh, Washington Redskins are going to be officially changing their name. Do they uh, say what they're going to change the name to? No, that's what I, I was like going to throw that out there and speculate. Like, I wonder what, uh, you know, what they're going to pivot to and like what kind of name options are out there even for them. I don't yeah. Know. Are they still going to represent uh, like Native Americans or are they going to completely change? Because how would you know? Name- oh, they wouldn't change it completely. Right. I would yeah, think, yeah. yeah, they would try to keep uh, some semblance of what it used to be. Yeah. No, like, I don't think they would. They call it the Washington Natives? No, it's, I don't just, know. it's just like how the bullets went to the Wizards. Mm. You know they're not. They're going to go completely opposite. You think so? Yeah, yeah. I would. Th- I would think I don't, the, the I don't Washington think... White Skins. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah no. They're not. They're not going to do that. They'll. Do, yeah, they'll do something. Yeah. Else. That wouldn't work for yeah, well. Yeah, no, I don't think that's how. <laughs> that's how it's going to go. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you know what? Do you, do you now? Do you guys think that this is going? Because that's they have a long pedigree, right? Isn't that company? I mean, isn't that team been? Around yeah, for, yeah. I forever. mean, they've been trying to change that name since like two thousand or earlier than that. So this has been a discussion for a long time. It was a t- the same time that the the bullets switched over to the wizards. Mm. So that was a big deal, right? The, oh, because it was a bullet. Yes. Oh so, my gosh. So the bullet. That, now that's stupid. At yeah, the same time, they were coming stupid. after the Washington Redskins and and trying to get them to change. And so, and of course, this is what's going on with. The climate yeah, right now. Well, you know, they're going to have to change it from wizards, yeah. I'm assuming, because wizards is gender, right? That's a man, you know. Oh, God. Yeah, I, don't know. I don't know. I think <laughs> you could fucking say that about war- anything. Yeah, warlocks. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, what do you guys think? Do you guys think the market is going to uh, punish them or is going to reward them for this change? What do you guys think? I, I don't know, because I feel like there it, it, it seems like there's this real even split in our country right now of people that are for this type of stuff mm-hmm. and then the people that are not. So yes. the que- I guess the better question is, are there more NFL supporters that fall in line with that than, than that don't, mm-hmm. right? Because I really, don't you feel like that? I feel like it's a split of people that think that, you know, Aunt Jemima needs to come off the fucking syrup and, right. you know, what are the other ones that are getting pulled right yeah, now? There's so yeah. many of these that are getting pulled and changed. <clears throat> I think that... that I don't ha- mind if things get changed this way. I, I mind when they get changed by mob and vandal right. and then, because that's just, there's a there's a proper way to do I don't mind. Yeah. I'm just curious to see what the market's going to say because it seems like the NFL is trying to stay ahead of scru- this kind of scrutiny, so they're they're making changes ahead of people. There's there's a lot of silly ones out here. This one actually is, I mean, Redskins. Like yeah. it's it's kind of uh yeah, like I could see where people get offended by that. Yeah, but it would be interesting because you figure, you know, I'm not a big sports fan, but I have family members that are, and the ones that are hardcore fans are are deep, like they're deep fans. Like I have fans that are, I have family members that are 49er fans. 
where it's like the, when the, the baby's first, you know, onesie is a 49er thing. Right. And, you know, th- their house has stuff in there that's 49er. And it's their aunts and uncles and grandparents. It's oh, like a I religion. Know. So uh, and because the Redskins have been around since 1930, whatever, I wonder if these th- there's these hardcore fans. Oh, they're going to be pissed. You yeah. Know? Yeah, for sure. It, it is a tribal thing. Like it, you do like really, like you said, like people paint their houses. Like I've seen crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. they're, they're the face painting and all this, like to go to the game. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, the hardcores are going to not be happy about this at oh, all. Anyway. Yeah. What would you guys do this weekend, by the way? Did you guys have a good weekend? Uh, it was relaxing, dude. It was we, hot here. Oh, it was, oh, you had no AC? It was real hot. No, no, no. My AC's been fine Oh, now. fixed. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. No, that's been fixed for a while. We went out to the beach, though. We, we drove down there for a day. Hung out. It was mm. beautiful down there. Yeah, nice. we went to um, Carmel uh, because Jessica's like, we have a spot on our wall. She's been moving, you know, when you're, I guess when you're pregnant, you want to change everything in the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, she's done a lot of good. I've heard, yeah. She's done a lot of good things, but this is definitely an instinctual thing, right? But she, there was a space on the wall and she wants, she's like, hey, wouldn't it be fun to put a piece of art on the wall? And I'm like, yeah, let's go to, you know, Target and whatever. And she's like, no. Like a real, like let's. What if we shopped for like a legit, like piece of art, something that is nice and oh, that Carmel has some really it. cool spots. Well, There's, so I'm like, okay, you know, I could do that. I guess we could do that. You know, <laughs> there's a bulldog PC oh. at one of them. Did you go to all the all the art places? We in went Carmel? to all the ones we could find, and we're walking in, and I'm looking at, and nothing really spoke to us, luckily, because yeah, because they're like <laughs> they're like eight grand. Oh yeah, ten, twenty, even. Yeah, yeah I'm like, uh, did you go in this? There's one that there's a there's a guy who paints, and I want his stuff. I want to. He's got this bulldog. He has bulldog art. Like all I, I know, I walked in. Did there. you see it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I want that. That bridge is a big, tall piece. Yeah, how much was that? Oh, it's, it's like, like $12,000. No, no, no. It's like 20 something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I, I want that piece so bad. I don't like art that much. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I saw, we're looking at it. I'm like, I don't know, babe. This, <laughs> this stuff's real. Let's, nothing really spoke to us, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think what would be a price that I would be willing to pay? Well, the thing, though, wouldn't be eight grand. When you get, yeah, but here's the thing with, with art, right? It's, uh, you know, you tease me all you want with the sneakers and stuff like that, but they, they hold value. And especially pieces like that, if you have an artist who it's a one of a kind, there's no more replicas of it or any other pieces out there, or there's replicas, but there's no other real pieces like that. You know, if as long as he's a good artist and that you continue to hold that piece, it ain't going to go get cheaper. Sure. And yeah. if you if you were ever hard up, you should be able to sell that piece of art for what you bought it for, or potentially more. So, it's just tying up twenty thousand dollars on your wall. That's yeah. What you yeah. Say. It's just that, hard to justify sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It that, would have to. It would have to really really communicate to me for me to spend, you know, even a thousand dollars. Like like the dogs playing poker. Like I get it. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> that's stupid. fun. It has to be yeah. something I put up and you know I look yeah. at it and I was like, oh this affects me. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I'm glad I spent a thousand dollars. Twenty thousand dollars the painting needs to yeah. talk to me and tell me secrets. So not just a bunch of splatters. Well I guess yeah. I guess there's a I guess there's that area though you have to understand so if it's something that's a thousand or under a thousand, the likelihood that it holds its value or maybe worth something sure. five, ten years from sure. now is probably not. I'm just saying if I spend twenty grand on a painting, I want uh, the the magic mirror from Sleeping Beauty or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> I want to put it up and be like, What are the lottery numbers? Uh, you know? So oh, did this- you see like at the beaches, like how like filled they are yes, now? Oh yeah. man. So I was in Santa Cruz and we like saw that. Uh, and we actually got to go to this this one restaurant I love like finally opened up again. We were like the the second customer for them, so that was cool. And, and I was like hanging out with Courtney with that, but uh, we went to the the pool uh, that just opened up uh, close to us, and just the the residents were able to go. But they had like such like that they, they take their temp- temperature. Like we had like little sections by ourselves. We had to wear the masks and everything, and then we'd go in. Uh, but there was this one spot where it catches all the bugs and stuff. And I was swimming in there and this bug floated right past me into that little drain thing. It was the biggest fucking beetle like I've ever seen, oh, dude. Gross. In the pool? Shit out of me. Yeah. Gross. Have you ever heard of bark beetles? Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, they dude. are. Dude, yeah. uh, I've never seen one. I was like, is this from Africa? What is this yeah. thing? You know, like prehistoric bug, man. <laughs> And then I saw another one like at my house, like that night it flew. I'm like, is, is something happening? Is Dude. there like the, you know, murder hornets now to bark beetles? <laughs> They're not, What's happening? What are those bugs that if you step on them, they smell really bad? Oh, the stink bugs. Stink bugs. <laughs> that makes sense. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. So I guess if you step on those, 
they stink everything up. Is that real? Yeah. Does that really happen? Yeah, they do. Like, and, and some of them spray you. Oh, you know, what they, the hell? they stick their butt up in there and they try and spray Beetles you. Beetles in a pool, though, would have probably turned me off. I would have been out of that pool pretty Yeah, fast. man. I was like, where'd this come from? And then I showed Courtney and she almost like passed out. Oh, dude. Yeah. While we were walking in Carmel, you know, there's lots of people outside or whatever. And we're walking back to the car and there's these dudes walking towards us. And, you know, I, I think when you, once you reach a certain age, you can sense that as a guy's walking towards you, he's going to say something. You know what I mean? Like there's going to be some, I can just feel it, right? Mm -hmm. So these dudes are walking towards us and they look like they, they, they're, they're probably late 30s. Uh, they look like those guys that lift weights, take some steroids, but eat shitty. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Kind of red and bloated and, and, <laughs> yeah. and they had the, the Puffy Ed, and, yeah, Ed Hardy yeah. shirt on. So yeah. they like, they never yeah, left. No lat syndrome. Yeah. Or, Super yeah. lat syndrome or whatever. Yeah, whatever that, that is. They, they, they never left, you know, the 90s or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're walking towards us. One guy's got his <laughs> arm around the other guy. I'm like, oh, they're drunk. They're going to say something. Oh. Sure enough, dude walks by. He's staring at me and I'm like, oh. so I turn around and, you know, I'm pretty good at diffusing situations. Didn't have to. The dude stops and he goes, Man, you're really fucking handsome, bro. <laughs> like, what? Wow. Yeah. He's like, and he goes to hug me. He's like, like, bro, come give me a hug, dude. I'm like, nah, I'm social distancing, dude. Let me give you a, <laughs> a fist bump. Like, that's the weirdest <laughs> that, thing ever. That's a, I had a, it wasn't like like that. Like, that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, I was at. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica was like, what yeah. the hell's going like, that, on? That's, some, that's something to be proud of right there. I'm going to be honest <laughs> yeah, with you. Yeah. But uh, I was at the gas station with Courtney. We were about ready to go over the hill, and there was this guy like in an old – uh, like a Mustang 5.0 that was like sick. It was all tricked out and everything. And like the guy was so great. He had he had those like um, those glasses that were like kind of uh, rainbow, like mirrored out. You, you know, know, those are back like, in style, right? Oh my God. He had spiky hair. It, it was like a flashback. He, he might as well have puka shells on. That's oh, all geez. coming back right now. Yeah. Wow. The, the, the big like, oh, it, I, the like, you remember Oakley's, the, 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 um, the Oakley razor blades yes. and the, yeah. and the yes. big mirror glasses that are, yeah, that's all like, popular. He had like shaved like uh, bricks, like, in the side of his head. No, he didn't. I swear to God. And so he starts driving by, like like close to where I was like filling up, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy. And I'm like, sick car, bro. <laughs> he's like, he's like, yeah, brother. Like, yeah. and then was, like peels out. Was right he young me. or was he old? Uh, he was he was a young guy. Yeah, yeah. He was a young guy. He was like twenties. And then I'm in there like, and, I, and I'm joking with Courtney, like we're joking about it. And I'm you know this DB over here, and, <laughs> and the kids heard me say that, and they're like, "What's DB, Dad? Oh, way to go! What's DB? Did and you it, think fast and make some shit up, or did you uh, have to no? So donut actually, butt or something? No, we told, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We told them it's like this is a this is something we only say within you know our family, <laughs> but it's a really funny because we you know we we, we 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 called it out. We're like it's douchebag, and they're like like. Well, we didn't explain yeah. what it douche? was or yeah. anything, but like you know, they, they had a great time saying it because like this is a funny, yeah. this is a funny word. Just wait till like, you get a call funny. from the teacher. I know, yeah, yeah. yeah I know that. Calling and, everybody. And, and my, you know, their their friends' parents. You know, I'm like, dude, okay. If I hear about this, you know, you're in trouble. Oh, uh, dude, no, what was the, who was that football player played for the Raiders? It was a big in the '90s. White dude, blonde hair, flat top, would get the lines. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're talking about. Um, this, they did a whole thirty thirty on him. Um, he looked like that, right? Like what Justin's describing. Uh, Romanowski. Romanowski. Is that yes. who it is? Yeah, yeah. That's oh, who you're thinking okay. of. Okay. Known for his hits and shit. <laughs> I think so. He was, yeah. a, he was yeah. a mean player, I think man. So. Hey, uh, uh, before we transition to the questions, a uh, cool study just came out um, about the most effective way to lower cholesterol when you have uh, familial um, hypercholesteremia, which is cholesterolemia. This is a condition that – this is the one condition that you really need to t tend to treat because the cholesterol is so, so high that it really, really causes problems. When people measure like a cholesterol number of like 500 or 600 or whatever. And in the past, they've recommended that they, low, that they dramatically reduce cholesterol-containing foods and saturated fats. Well, they, an international team of experts on heart disease and, and diet – said that there's no evidence that a low saturated fat diet reduces cholesterol. Instead, you know what they recommended? Mm. Low carb diet. Mm. They said a low carb, low sugar diet is far more effective according to their research of all mm. the studies at lowering cholesterol. So kind of cool, nice. right? Yeah. yeah. First question is from Retep Oncalb. <clears throat> what are some of the best moves for building bicep and tricep size and strength? Oh yeah. Good old biceps and triceps work them arms. Um, so we can, most people understand bicep and tricep exercises as isolation movements. And most people would say, or magazines or, or, or internet articles would say something like, you know, barbell curls for biceps, 
skull sh- crushes for triceps. You know, those free weight isolation exercises are good for building mass in those in those uh, those two muscles. However, um, I don't think they build nearly as much muscle as a compound exercise would for those two areas. And this is something that I learned, you know, later on in my in my career. Uh, I understood this with legs. You know, if, if you were to compare the biceps and triceps uh, to your legs, which would be maybe your quadriceps or like your hamstring or like your your triceps, right? And your hamstrings would be like your biceps. Uh, what are the best exercises for quads? None of them include isolation exercises. It's all these compound lifts like barbell squats and you know front squats and that kind of stuff. Same thing is true for biceps and triceps. You know, uh, palms up or supinated grip pull-ups or chin-ups, really focusing on squeezing the biceps. Amazing exercise for building the biceps. It's a pull-up, but it really works the biceps really well. And you, you're obviously using a lot more weight because mm-hmm. it's a compound lift. And then for triceps, like a close grip bench press or dips. Oh, yeah. Those will build more strength and muscle than any other isolation exercise I can think of. We did a whole episode on these. Mm-hmm. So if you're if this is someone new to listening to the the podcast, and you we touch on that among other things uh, on the episode. The other thing is like frequency, right? So um, you know I, I agree the the biggest thing or best exercise ever that put size on my triceps were, uh, and I prefer incline. So, but I mean close grip bench press. And it's just, it's simple. Uh, you, if you do skull crushers or you do these isolation exercises, just look at how much weight you can do with those. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe if you're really, really strong, you're doing, a, you know, 100 pounds or so, mm-hmm. you know, give or take on skull crushers. But, I mean, you could load a, you could load a barbell with, you know, maybe 225. Yeah, the same person would do 225. On right, a right. So you can just load it way more. Um, and then just learning to focus on using the triceps more than your your delts or your chest when you do an exercise like that. And then back to what I was my point with frequency, it's just increasing the frequency that you're you're hitting those muscle groups. I, I think that's normally the go to before I get into like major exercise selection. Very very uh, rare that it's like somebody who, who's trying to grow their buys and tries and they haven't tried all these different exercises. It's normally that their their programming uh, just needs some work. And normally it's somewhere where you increase frequency is what ends up helping the most. Yeah, it's definitely about, uh, like you mentioned, the load uh, in terms of like uh, an exercise that you're going to you're going to go through this exercise knowing that you can actually load uh, a substantial amount more. But it's 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 about creating the, the loudest signal with that. So the most force demand. So I have to be able to recruit uh quite a bit more muscle fibers, you know, throughout my body to produce, you know, one of these compound lifts or one of these other, you know, more involved type exercises. And that, uh, you know, that, that adds up your, your muscles, even the, on the individual level, your, your muscles, you know, get benefit from that and, you know, tend to respond, uh, quite more substantially than just, you know, these isolated exercises. And if you look at like the program, so maps aesthetic is a good example of like when you're trying to target a muscle group that, and develop it, right? That whole program is designed around picking a muscle group that you want to develop more and if you unpack the programming, there's, you know, you have your three foundational days where you're doing these major compound lifts. And then we have what are called focus days, which are on the, the opposite days where you're doing that more isolation. So the cable push downs, the basic dumbbell curls, the, mm-hmm. the isolation type of exercises as volume builders on the other two days. But you're, I mean, you're hitting your arms technically, you know, three to five times a, a week. If you do that, they're going to grow, you know, especially if you're doing it well and and programming it well with good compound exercises and then isolation exercises to complement that. Yeah, I and here so here's a good example. I'm going to give you a generic kind of good tricep and bicep workout. So, um, you know, for biceps, you could do your supinated grip uh, pull-ups, really focusing on the bicep squeeze at the top. Start with that, and the next exercise would be like a barbell curl. And then maybe a hammer curl. Um, great mass building, muscle building combo right there. For triceps, I would do either weighted dips or close grip bench press to start with. Then you could do a skull crusher, which is a, you know the, the technical term is a lying tricep extension. And then an overhead tricep extension. Um, great combination. Those three exercises, put, do them in the order I just said. And for a lot of you listening, it's a, it'll, it'll elicit some pretty good results. Next question is from Eli Hall, double zero. Can you make gains on a three-day-a-week workout schedule? Oh, 80% yeah. of you listening right now, at least 80% of you listening right now, will make the best gains 
on a three day a week uh, workout schedule, a full body three day a week routine for most people and com- compare it to all the other body parts split and five day and six day a week routines, 80% percent or more of you will do better on the full body three day a week routine. And I remember when this became glaringly obvious to me, it was again later in my career and I figured this out for my clients well before I figured it out for myself. I, I, for some reason, and I think a lot of trainers uh, you know, fall prey to this, you think that you're different. Like, oh, it doesn't really apply to me. I'm, you know, yeah. Not like my clients or whatever. But I would get these advanced clients that would hire me, especially as I became more experienced and I had good referrals and people who were experienced who had good uh, you know, exercise knowledge would come hire me and they'd been working out already. And oftentimes I would start them on a three day a week routine. And one of the reasons why I would do that was my schedule was kind of full. Um, and it, it was it was better for me to train more people three days a week than it was to train less people at five days a week. And the other part of it was uh, I, I had this philosophy where let me try this and see how this works. If it doesn't work, then we'll try something else. And every single time, mm-hmm. the three day a week full body routine produced the best gains that they'd ever seen. And when I finally applied it to myself was when I looked at old uh, bodybuilding and muscle building publications. I mean, old, way back at the you know the, the turn of the century, um, the, you know, uh, in, you know the early 1900s and the 1920s, 1930s, back when strongmen and strength athletes, you know, didn't take steroids or supplements or anything. They all worked out this way. You know, mm-hmm. Steve Reeves worked out this way. John Grimmick worked out this way. Look them up. You'll see for yourself what they look like. These guys were natural for most of their career. So I remember I applied it to myself, and I'm glad I applied it to myself later in my career because at some point, after tra- after you train for about six seven years consistently, you know right away when something works. Yeah. And I remember the first time I did it, I got stronger right away, and I was like, "Holy cow, this is the way uh, most people work." Real yeah, well. it's just funny because uh, I-, I fell into that trap of more is better, more is better, and that that was just something that was always reiterated to me from my coaches, and you know, like whatever work you put in, you're gonna. You're you're gonna get back uh, tenfold, and so uh, you know to fall back. I would always kind of fall back into this three day a week regimen because uh, what I did in between, and we have to differentiate between like the workouts of this three days uh, versus what you do in between. And uh, I'm still working out technically, you know, the days in between, but it's it's all to foster recovery, and so it's it's a very uh, different mentality, and it's it's very different. Uh, exercises and movements, but in terms of the overall intensity of, of you know, a demanding workout, you know, keeping that three days with space in between tend to provide the best results for me and my clients. Uh, anytime I'd add four or five, it was in excess. Mm. Well, I think there's a, there's several reasons for that. I, I first of all, I wish I would have figured this out earlier. Oh, me too. I mean, I, I spent the first decade of of lifting weights, uh, you know, following every you know exercise program that was in a muscle and fitness magazine or, you know, like Justin's approach, which was more is better and just getting, you know, training intensely and more days and double days and thinking that the more I train, the more muscle I should build. Right. And, and the truth is, uh, one of the best things I ever did was start scaling back and going the other direction. And a couple of things happens and why, why I think that one, um, when you run like a five or six or seven day a week type of split, uh, and you split up your muscle groups. In order to hit each muscle two to three times a week, you have to be very consistent. You miss one of those days, and it throws that off completely. So when you run a full body routine, and and it's only three days a week, one, it's much easier to do three days a week uh, as far as making it to the gym or your or whatever than it is five or six. So and if you were to technically miss one day, you still got two full body workouts, which hits every muscle group at least twice in that week. So, and even if you only got one day that week, at least you atta- you touched every single muscle group, which for me, and, and and when I looked back at like my, you know, training consistency, it was just inevitable. This happens. I go for two or three weeks and then I'd have a, you know, inconsistent week and then some one muscle group would suffer, you know, and, and you know, and, and normally what suffers is the thing that I didn't like doing the most, right? That's what we always tend to do. And then when, you, when I get back in the rhythm again, I go back to the things I like doing and, mm-hmm. and then that, that muscle group that I'm lagging in continues to suffer. So I think that's one of the reasons. And there's another reason. When you have to train a muscle group three times in a week because you're doing full body, it also forces you 
uh, whether you like it or not, eventually to kind of scale back on the intensity. Mm-hmm. You, you learn your le- lesson pretty quickly of overdoing it uh, when you know you got to come back two days later and touch that muscle group again. So I think it naturally forces people to reduce the intensity of it, which is another thing that I think is over-applied. Uh, and definitely for myself, and I think anybody in this room could attest to, you know, tra- chasing that intensity and trying to crush the the muscle group in the gym. You just can't do that and get away with that when you're training full body three times a week. So I think there's a lot more than just, oh, what it does for for volume and what it does for frequency. I think it naturally, you know, benefits a lot of people for those reasons too. And so I think that's a lot of the success from that. There's one more thing I'd like to add, and this is just my own uh, theory. Um, But, you know, when you you work out, you get a localized – muscle building effect that's that's uh, directly related to the muscle that you're working. So if I work out my right bicep, I'm going to get a loud muscle building signal that's applied to my right bicep. However, there's an, another interesting phenomena that happens. You also get this systemic milder muscle building effect that kind of happens throughout the whole body. Okay, They've proven this in studies. They've actually done studies where they have people work out one arm and most of the muscle gains and strength gains happen in that arm, but the other arm mysteriously gains a little bit of muscle, a little bit of strength. Kind of mm-hmm. weird. Um, for people who are advanced, who are listening right now, who've been working out for a long time, you know, you've probably experienced this where you 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 do barbell squats. If you've never done them before, you start introducing them and your legs start to get stronger and bigger. You start to notice gains in your upper body too, in your yeah. arms. Like, what arms does that have to shoulders. do? Yeah, what does this have to do with my arms and my shoulders? I'm just put a back, you know, bar on my back and I did squats. Now, full body workout sends a very loud. First off, it's, you're all this, there's there's a lot of direct muscle building signals happening all the muscle groups that you're working. But because you're doing the whole body in a workout, you also enhance this very loud total body muscle building signal. And I think that complements the muscle building signals that are more direct. I think when you combine the two, you maximize the muscle building signal. Then you take the next day off, allow things to happen, to build, a little bit of recover, and then you go back and you do it again. And to this day, till this day, now there's lots of variations of this. So if you follow any of our MAPS programs, uh, all the muscle building ones, you'll find that almost all of them follow this kind of structure. There's three main workouts, two to three main workouts with other stuff in between, whether it be trigger sessions, focus sessions, or mobility work. But generally, the meat and potatoes of the program is typically two or three days of full body workouts. And the reason why we did that is it just works. It works for most people. Um, so, and by the way, right now, this is how I'm training. Right now, this is how I almost always train. If I have extra time, I do mobility work on the other days. I do hikes and walks and that kind of stuff. But my routine, the exercises may change, the reps may change, the tempo may change, maybe the goal may change. But my basic structure that I followed now for well over half of my lifting career is a three-day-a-week full-body routine. By the way, when Doug hired me, when, when, when I first met Doug years ago in his 40s, he had experience working out. He had lots of experience lifting weights on his own. He followed lots of other types of programming. When he hired me, here was a guy, not a beginner, got some experience, already relatively fit, hard gainer, fit the classic profile of a hard gainer. I trained him two days a week, full-body two days a week, and in his late 40s made the best gains of his entire life. In fact, we have a before and after picture of that. If you if you scour his Instagram, Mind Pump Doug, or uh, yeah, Mind Pump Doug, you'll be able to find it. Made the best gains of his life two days a week, not even three. Next question is from Jules Tillman. What do you think of the Jefferson deadlift? Are there benefits to straddling the bar for building deadlift strength? So this is you guys know what this exercise is, right? Yeah, yeah. It goes yeah I had your to legs. look it up. At first, I was like confused with the Jefferson curl versus this, but then I I I was like, oh, that's what they call it. Yeah, it's just a very odd uh, lift. Mainly, it doesn't look like anything else. It's, it's off center, obviously. Um, here's some of the benefits I could see. Now, admittedly, I've never consistently trained this. Yeah, I've never consistently I've never programmed it. Never programmed it consistently, but I've messed around with it. And based off of what I know of the human body, I would say it probably it's definitely strengthening uh, same similar muscles that you would get with maybe a trap bar deadlift. Mm-hmm. But the difference is you're rotated, so it might help with strengthening a slightly rotated upper body while you lift, which might have some functional abilities in the real world when you're lifting a couch or moving things. 
Yeah. One one thing I would say is make sure you train both sides evenly. I could see this really causing problems oh, yeah. with somebody favoring one side, you know? Yeah, that's immediately was I, I, what I was thinking in terms of asymmetry and, you know, sort of addressing that. I've seen people, you know, like create these types of exercises where they're sort of like, uh, you know, loaded uh, off center. And uh, it, it does kind of help from a functional standpoint to be able, you know, to address this in everyday life because all these – opportunities comes up all the time like there's something heavy that you need to move and the weight shifts on you and you know training your body to react and adapt to that is i think is very beneficial um uh, and and again i i haven't i haven't done these enough to really like you know voice too much on it other than i speculate that it is like you you are getting you know anterior posterior a little bit like you would with a trap bar so that would you know where my mind would go is like similar benefits to that with also the anti-rotational uh work with heavy weight as well it looks to me like a a um sumo deadlift has married a a barbell hack squat mm -hmm. that's kind of what i when i look at it that's mm -hmm. what it what it look the benefits that you get from sumo deadlifting and what you get from like a barbell hack squat kind of molded into one one exercise um i don't see it having the question is referring to a, a, a traditional or conventional deadlift I don't see it having a lot of carryover to that because if you notice when you do the Je Jefferson deadlift, you're in a much more squatted position. Hmm. It's much closer to the hack squat mm -hmm. or the sumo deadlift than it is a conventional deadlift. So I don't see it doing a lot of carryover to a, a conventional deadlift. But like you guys, this is I've messed around with this, but I, this is not – uh, made its way into like regular programming for me. If I were to do it with a client, um, this would be my client who just like, they love like unconventional lifts and mm -hmm. functional training and challenging themselves. Do you like know, bam ba bamboo bar stuff. With yeah, them too, yeah. Yeah. You know, they just, they, they, uh, cause I, like Sal was saying, there's a little bit of rotation in the upper body while you're having to stabilize that weight. And then it, it is challenging that way. That could have some good functional carryover. I'm not saying that that would be a bad exercise. I definitely wouldn't put it. If someone came to me and said, Adam, I want to get my my conventional deadlift up. I saw these Jefferson deadlifts. I heard this could help that. I would not program that in that with, with that intention. It would be more of a fun, functional, unconventional exercise that I would put in into a routine because I like to challenge my client that way. They like the challenge. So if you're asking the question like that and you and you like really challenging exercises, then sure, I think there's nothing yeah. wrong with it, doing it. It was invented in the 1800s by, by a strong man. And the thing back then, strong men liked to, they, they would do these exhibitions. And the goal of the exhibition was to impress the audience. And they'd find weird ways of lifting a lot uh, of weight. You know, there's like a, a hip bridge type exercise that some would do where they put a board across their lap and then, uh, you know, a, a horse would walk across it or right. all these weird kind of lifts. A Jefferson deadlift balances weight between the front and the back of the body. So technically, if you get really good at it, uh, biomechanically speaking, you should be able to lift a lot of weight with this because it's a little bit more balanced. You're not you're not having to use so much of your low back and your back to support you. There's a lift in I think it's in Scotland or Ireland Ireland called the Dinny Stones. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Mm -hmm. These two incredibly heavy stones, and that's kind of yeah. how they lift them: one in front, one in back, and they got to they got to stand up yeah, with their them. Handles like, it almost like they're they're in the the rocks or the cement or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. so lifting like this is was around for a long time. It's just because it's offset and weird and it, it's it lost popularity. But you know, I'm gonna mess around with it a little bit. I'd love to report back on you know how I felt. Next question is from Carlos Velasquez. Us. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> a podcaster? Yeah, I, I knew I wanted to be on it. I didn't have podcasts. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. 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 I, you know, Living I, the dream. When I was really young. Who's, who, wait, before we answer, because I don't know your guys' answers. Right. Who do you think is going to be the most f different from what we ended up doing? Oh. The most the far. The most different? Ooh. I like, think you probably you. Yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. yeah I think oh, I would you. think Justin we'll would be like that. You think me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would yeah, guess. I Justin would, thought he was gonna be a rock star for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was later on, dude. Yeah. As a little I kid, definitely admit that. Though. I would bet that Justin wanted to be uh, an athlete of some sort, football player or something like that. Yeah, somewhat. But uh, honestly, I was more driven to be a veterinarian, which was oh really? Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, nobody oh. would ever guess that. Uh, it and I was actually really interested in it to the point where 
my parents introduced me to this veterinarian friend of theirs and I did a little bit of like shadowing and watched, you know, the day to day stuff and then was immediately like, okay, this isn't for yeah. me. Yeah, like, cause it's just sick animals. Just like, you when know, that they big, got to put them to sleep. When that and, big white plastic glove came out, you just had to know. I'm like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I got to stick my whole arm in that. That yeah. doesn't sound like a good like, idea. There, there was like this turtle with this huge boil on its face. And like, it was like pop. It was just like, Oh, this is horrible. <laughs> They're like extracting the anal glands of the whatever. Exactly. The yeah, it's yeah. not it's not the you know the glorified. But again, we we need them, and I think it's a great profession. But uh, I definitely moved on from that. That's a that's so good by your parents to have you actually go and follow a veterinarian because that could have either that could have also worked in the opposite where you were like, yes, this is definitely. Oh yeah, if if, if I was into it, that would have solidified it. For that me. really did. They did that for that reason. You were interested mm-hmm. in, it and they said, hey, let's go look at. Our, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that good parenting. Cool. There, I. Yeah. W- <laughs> so now yeah. here's the thing. So uh, for me, I'm thinking about before I was probably 13, 14. Because by the time I was 14, 15, I knew I was gonna, I wanted to work in fitness or with exercise somehow. I thought maybe physical therapist, owning a gym or whatever. So I knew that at that age, like 100%. But before that, you know, I th- at one point I said scientist because I love reading so much and I like science. Uh, another point at another time I said salesman. Didn't know what I was selling, but uh, I, I knew that I liked to talk, um, and that that was pretty accurate. I think I think that's an <laughs> accurate prediction. Nothing too crazy. I remember my brother was little. We asked him what he wanted to be, and he said a uh, fire truck. So <laughs> yeah, I'm like you want to be a fire truck when you grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so from like eight to eight years old, I can think of that far back of like thinking about this. Before that, I can't tell you. So I don't know what like like ch- little child childhood dream, but eight's pretty young, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's really young. Yeah. I wanted things like I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted a, any job that made a lot of money. That was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was definitely like with the main driver. They, I, I would guess they're like, "What do you want to be when you grow up, Adam?" You're like, "Well, what makes a lot of money? That's yeah, exactly what's, what's how the most money? A hundred percent. That's yeah. how it went down. Hundred percent. It went down like that. I Wall mean, Street. I, yes. I, there's a video that I actually. <clears throat> it's a funny. I haven't thought about this memory in a long time. When my mom remarried when I was eight, there's a video uh, that I'm on and I'm like standing in front of the money tree at my my parents' wedding. And there's like all this money on. You ever seen a money tree at a yeah, wedding before? Yeah, you know, yeah. they, everyone clips and it was like you know, full of all these dollar bills and shit, right? And I'm just like standing, the cameraman comes running over and they're like, what are you doing, Adam? And I'm just like in awe of the of the money tree. <laughs> yeah, I swear to God. So <laughs> at a very young age, I think I think you just, I put it together at a young kid, as a young kid that we didn't have a lot of stuff. And so I wanted things, you know, and uh, knew that I would, ha- I would have to work. I wasn't going to inherit anything. <laughs> so yeah. Didn't yeah. you say at one point that when you wanted to be a lawyer and then you realized what that it was, took? Yeah, so, it, so I wanted to be a lawyer all the way until my senior year in junior or senior year in high school and what made as the girl I dated my junior senior year um, I came to her father's law office so like you I had an experience that made me go oh shit no I don't yeah. so I wanted to be a lawyer up until that point and I went to her dad's office one day and we walk in and and I, I it didn't help either that I probably didn't like he didn't like me very much which obviously made me not like a big fan of him as it is and then I go look at his office and then this happens right so we walk in this office and it was probably almost the size of our studio in here and it all the way around were books it was a bookshelf like crazy and I remember and I remember grabbing some out and looking at the names and they were just none not a single one looked appealing to me like to read and I remember asking him like did you read all these books and he was like yeah absolutely and yeah. i was like every fuck. word yeah i said yeah. fuck this because <laughs> none of them looked interesting to me i'm like oh my god the amount of law that they have to read uh and as a kid i mean even i mean as even as a young high school kid i knew i'd have to read i knew i'd have to probably read a lot a law of books but not to that that yeah. level and to 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 realize how well I would have to know law and how much of that I would have to read. I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, like, no, I don't want that anymore. Yeah, so, I remember, yeah. I mean, even when I first became a trainer, so I knew I wanted to work with exercise, but what I initially thought I was going to do was be a physical therapist because that was really the only profession, like professional profession that I knew that utilized exercise. Like I didn't realize you could really be a trainer or a gym manager. I didn't, I didn't, it just for whatever reason, didn't, did, pop into my head is that being like a career. So I became a trainer 
in order to uh, go to school at the same time. And I remember having this conversation with my manager at the time. This when I, I you know, I, I'd done real well. I became a fitness manager, and at that point, um, school was starting up. And I said, you know, I gotta, I gotta go back down to be a trainer because I need to start going to school. And they're like, well, what, you know, what do you want to do? I said physical therapy. And they said, can you bring out your your paycheck? And so I brought my paycheck out. And they said, you know, you already make more than a physical therapist. And I, I said, huh? I had no idea. And they said, do you like doing this? Do you think you would like working in a, in a clinical setting more than working in a gym and you know making less money? And I remember thinking, no, I, I love the gym. I would hate working in a hospital or, or clinical setting. And that was it. That was it. I, I knew well, I that's wanted right. to be You and gym. I have almost an identical story when it comes to like how we fell into the gym because we were both, I mean, you were what, 18, 19, yeah. I was 20. And I, we were both going to junior college. We both were going towards kinesiology. Mm-hmm. I too was thinking physical therapy, but my reason behind physical therapy was the money. Mm. And yeah. and once I got into personal training and I did well, and same very similar situation. At that time, I was telling them like, "Oh, I got to go part time because I got to finish my degree." And like each paycheck was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it finally got to a point where I was making six figures as a personal trainer in my early twenties as a kid. And, and at the time, it was a physical therapist. Average pay was less than that. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. right there. You know, eighty to one hundred and twenty. So I was already in that. I was already in that range. And just like you, I was like, would I rather work in a clinical setting with a lot of old people that are, you know? <laughs> Do you imagine if each? Because I was like studying to be a physical therapist. Imagine if we all were physical therapists instead. <laughs> yeah. How much boring this podcast would be. Bored out of our mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I didn't. And here's the thing: fifty I, more reps. Yeah, you know, we'd just be talking about a million reps of like doing things really slow. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing too: I don't mind working with old people rehab. I love that stuff. But here's a big difference: when you work in a gym. They're typically not sent to you by the doctor or insurance. Well, not only that. They want to be there. Some, a lot of times when you work, because I've helped physical therapists, a lot of times the patients come in and they're like, ah, okay, I don't really want to do this. But people hire you out of their own pocket. Oftentimes they want to be there. Well, it's not only that, experience. but you also yeah. you also get to change that. Right? I, I talk about not liking advanced age as much as you do or not liking kids. And I like I had a wheelhouse. You sound like, like such a great guy, you know? Right, you're right. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's me just being honest about how I felt. But the truth is I took all of them, right? Right. I trained lots of clients in advanced age. I trained lots of kids too. Um, As I got, you know, longer in my career, I I tried to hone in on mostly what I liked. But that what I did also like about being a trainer was that I got to do all of that. And like, if you're Mm -hmm. in physical therapy, you're basically speaking to a type of person, right? right? Rehabbing, rehab. It's all rehab. I liked rehab work. I like teaching clients that. I mean, a big part of our job is that most... Uh, physical therapist, once they get done with rehab, tell you to go see a personal trainer yeah. in a gym. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we just continued it on. And it wasn't long after me getting enough of those clients that I do and like, okay, well, what did you do with your physical therapist to get here? And then I started to learn what they did to get them to, right. to, to the point where I would take them from there, which, I mean, that's what led to me to rehab my, my knee surgery was I was, I remember going to my physical therapist and I was unimpressed with what they were doing and thought oh, I could do this. Yeah. So I enjoy that. I enjoyed that, but you would have, that would have kept you just doing that where, you know, training. I got yeah. athletes. I got obese people. I oh, got so much more variety. Yeah, yeah, hard gainers. I mean, you get everything. Yeah, I had um, when I had my studio for the last you know twelve years of my my career. I had physical therapists in my studio because I, I saw their value was tremendous. Oh, yeah. I mean, physical therapists in terms of diagnosing uh, movement issues and pain issues are some of the best that mm-hmm. you'll see anywhere. Good ones, right? Of course, mm-hmm. there's always good and bad ones, but the good ones are just the. And I had an exceptional one. That you know worked in my facility. She rented space for me, and she was so good. I used to love working with her because I'd watch her, mm-hmm. and I'd learn from what she was doing. I'd hear what she'd say. I'd watch her diagnose, and I learned a tremendous amount. And I, and I even before that, I always worked with physical therapists. But I love the gym. I love the gym environment, and it was I'm, I made the right decision, obviously, because I I don't think I would have enjoyed a clinical setting as much. You know, it's funny back when when uh, you know, when I said I, I wanted to do sales when I was younger. You know, I, I, as I worked through the fitness space, I, I I became good at training, but also very good at sales and sales training. I did a lot of this for 24 Hour Fitness, and I did a lot of training um, later on. And there was a short period where I thought, well, you know, this is a skill I can apply it in other places. And I went and worked in the banking industry, and that was a great learning lesson for me because as much as you can sell in another place, for me. It's got to be something I have a passion for because I hate it otherwise. And I did. I went to the banking industry and I did investments 
And, you know, for me, I like investments, but it's not, I don't have a passion for it. I don't want to go out and help people, you know, with investments. And it was so boring. It was the first time in my life I looked at the clock. I never, I never forget. I was looking at the clock, waiting for it to become noon so I could go take my lunch. And I remember thinking, I'm not going to live like this. This yeah. sucks. Because when I worked in the gym, I never looked at the clock. The only time I looked at the clock was to go look at it and go, oh shit, it's late. I should probably go home. <laughs> Never. And, and I did that in the bank and I was like, yeah, I belong in fitness. Well, you know I remember I mean? taking a uh, one of those, you know, I don't know what you call them, like a personality type test uh, in, I think seventh grade was when I, the first time that I realized that maybe sales was where I was supposed to be too, because it, it like everything pointed in that direction. Mm-hmm. So I took one of those 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 tests and it's like one of the like hundred questions and they, they survey you and you answer and then it said like, number one was like sales for me. So- I, and then I have family, right? So a lot of my family, that's what they did was, was sales. So I figured, okay. And then when I f- fell into training, see, I fell into training not realizing until I was actually training clients how much of it was sales. Mm-hmm. And that to me was the like, oh, okay, this is it. This mm-hmm. is what I'm supposed to do because I love the fitness aspect. I love working out. I love that. I love kinesiology. I was already heading that direction anyway. So that that fascinated me. Then I found out you can make a little bit of money in it, and then I found out a good portion of it was actually sales, and I was like, "Oh shit, this is like it's it's, it's mostly sales. You have to sell someone every single day on why they got to eat right. You got to sell them almost every day on on right. why they need to exercise and move right. You're selling somebody all the time on changing their life uh, in fundamental ways, and so sales. I'm not just talking about selling training. That's obvious. I'm talking about selling ideas. Right. That's a lot of what you do when you're a personal trainer. So uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful marriage. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Um, so if you're listening to us and you can't see us, you're missing out. Let me tell you. Yeah. Go to YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. Um, also, if you want to find us on social media individually, you can find us on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Guys love to do it. And I, I'm just as guilty of this. Oh, boy, I got some stories. Yeah, I, I'm just as guilty of... All right, it's bulk time or it's bulking season, you know? <laughs> yeah. Which really all that meant was there was no strategic plan to build muscle really or to gain strength or to just It was about shoveling food. It was about I was